coming up on a newscast. Foreign Minister of Seoul and Beijing hold talks to follow up on last month's summit in Indonesia. A range of topics were discussed from North Korea's nuclear threats to boosting cooperation. Bavelin COVID vaccines are available in South Korea to everyone 12 and over. The government decided to make them available for more people ahead of the winter months. Ukraine is increasingly calling on foreign powers to assist the war-torn country. It is now suffering from power outages in many regions following Russian strikes on energy infrastructure. Hello, good weeks off to a smooth start. I'm Daniel Che here to bring the latest. Let's begin with our top story. The foreign ministers of South Korea and China discussed the two countries' latest interests and pending issues. They were a follow-up to the summit between their leaders in Bali last month. Kim Dami starts us off. The two top diplomats of South Korea and China have agreed to stay in close contact so that the momentum built up between their countries' leaders can continue and potentially facilitate a visit from Xi Jinping to South Korea. Park Jin and Wang Yi sat down on Monday, this time virtually to evaluate the summit held on the sidelines of G20 last month. It was seen as a crucial milestone in a new era of South Korea-China cooperation based on mutual respect and common interests. The FMs then settled on the speeding of high-level talks even more, including visits to each other's country. They will also accelerate consultations for the adoption of a joint action plan for the future development of South Korea-China relations, which Buck proposed during their last meeting back in August. Korean Peninsula issues atop the agenda, with Buck emphasizing that South Korea-China cooperation is needed more than ever, as bringing North Korea back to denuclearization talks is a common interest. Wang responded that Beijing will play a constructive role in dealing with issues on the peninsula. Also on the table included expanding of flight routes and revitalizing exchanges of cultural content. Back in 2017, China unofficially banned all things Hallyu following South Korea's decision to deploy the U.S. missile defense system THAAD, which China regards as a threat because of its powerful radar systems. Seoul has a long requested that Beijing lift its ban on Korean cultural content. Kim Dami, Arirang News. President Yoon urged across to Isle Corporation for next year's budget, the approval of which is behind schedule at the National Assembly. These were his remarks during a weekly meeting with Prime Minister Han Dok Su. President Yoon desperately urges bipartisan cooperation and prompt passage of the budget bill as there should be no partisanship when it comes to matters related to people's livelihoods. In particular, he noted the importance of approving revisions on the Corporate Tax Act and the Korea Electric Power Corporation Act. As for lowering the maximum corporate tax rate, which the Democratic Party opposes, President Yoon noted the new tax code is aimed at revitalizing the economy by encouraging more investment and jobs. The government is also pushing for a revision of the Electric Power Corporation Act to increase the cap on corporate bond issuance by KEPCO to help make up for its massive losses. The nation's exports are down so far this month compared to a year ago, mainly on a decline in shipments of semiconductors, the country's biggest export item. Korea Customs Service says exports in the first 10 days of the month were down 20.8 percent to 15.4 billion U.S. dollars. Shipments of semiconductors fell nearly 28 percent. By destination, exports to the largest trading partner, China, dropped by more than 34 percent. So far this year, South Korea recorded an all-time high trade deficit of $4.9 billion. South Korea's exports of vehicles rose to an all-time high last month thanks to brisk demand for eco-friendly cars overseas. This was despite unfavorable factors like rising interest rates and logistics disruptions from the recent trucker strike. Shin Sebyeok has the details. South Korea's auto exports in November reached an all-time high thanks mostly to solid demand for eco-friendly cars and improving supplies of semiconductors. Data from the trade ministry shows that for five months in a row, both export value and volume have marked an on-year rise. In terms of volume, nearly 220,000 cars were sold overseas, up 25 percent, marking a record high. The value of auto exports last month came in at 5.4 billion U.S. dollars, up 31 percent on-year. 
all despite factors such as interest rate hikes and logistics disruptions from the trucker strike that began late last month. The record figure came on the back of brisk overseas sales of eco-friendly cars, which take up well over one-fifth of the country's total. As for units sold, it saw on-year growth of nearly 15 percent, with over 50,000 units shipped abroad. In terms of value, it jumped over 20 percent on-year, reaching an all-time monthly high of just under $1.5 billion. In particular, shipments of electric and hydrogen cars came in at $800 million, also hitting all-time records. An expert attributed the rise to the improved quality of South Korean-made cars. South Korean car makers have been striving to improve their quality, especially their luxury brands. Because of that, Korean-made EVs are now enjoying growing popularity globally. Meanwhile, auto production and domestic sales also showed a strong performance in November. Domestic sales jumped 8.4 percent and production was up over 25 percent. With such record-breaking figures coming out month after month, the trade ministry expects the value of auto exports for 2022 as a whole to surpass $50 billion for the first time. As of the end of November, overseas sales had reached worth $48.7 billion. The same expert said he expects the current trend will continue at least until the first half of 2023, citing South Korean car makers' strong performances in both production volume and quality management. Shin se Arirang News. With inflation cutting into people's purchasing power, local households saw real income fall in Q3 by 5% on year. Data from Statistics Korea shows while goods and services got more expensive, wages were stagnant. Income for business owners in real terms fell by 2.5%. Consumer price inflation soared above 6% in July, and experts forecast it to remain above 5% for the foreseeable future. South Korean couples who got married in the recent five years notch record declines, rather, and nearly half of those couples who had married for the first time had no kids. According to Statistics Korea, the number of these newlywed couples in 2021 dropped 7 percent on year to a little over 1.1 million, the fewest since the figure was first compiled in 2015. Among them, almost 80 percent were married for the first time, and 45.8 percent of those couples had no kids. The average number of children these couples had was 0.66, hitting an all-time low. Statistics Korea attributed these trends to the shrinking population of people in their 20s and 30s and economic challenges and the pandemic. Meanwhile, the average combined annual incomes of couples married for the first time jumped almost 7 percent to around 64 million won, or about 49,000 U.S. dollars, which is the biggest increase on record due to a rise in the number of households on two incomes. New bivalent COVID vaccines have become available in South Korea to everyone 12 and over. Until now, only adults had been eligible for it. As risk of infection is higher in the cold season, the government decided to make these changes. Shin Yeon tells us more. South Korea is trying to get through the winter without any more waves of COVID-19. How? By making new booster shots, also known as bivalent vaccines, available to more people. Specifically, anyone who's 12 years and older and who already had their primary shots at least 90 days ago. Reservations will be open from this Monday. Those who are able to find leftover vaccines can get their shots from this day. Others can book their shots, which will be given from December 19. There are two bivalent vaccines made by Pfizer available. One against the original strain of COVID and the BA1 strain the other to protect against the BA4 and BA5 strains. Health officials have been encouraging teens to get vaccinated as data shows this age group is three to five times more vulnerable to getting infected with Omicron. Reinfection risks were 1.8 times greater among teens than adults. Teens currently make up nearly one out of five reinfection cases. But there are still many who first need to get their primary shots. Up till last Friday, only 66.5 percent of teens had completed their primary shots, and only 11.5 percent have received a regular booster shot. Officials say this is because many teens and their parents are worried about any side effects from the vaccines, 
Regardless, the officials are asking people to get their extra shots, as the colder weather means there's higher risk of infection. Health authorities are also concerned over stocks of cough medicine this winter, as some of the materials for cough medicine come from China. People in China are scrambling to buy cough medicine and face masks, fearing a spike in infections due to the recently eased COVID regulations. That's why Korea's Ministry of Food and Drug Safety has asked local companies that have been importing raw materials from China to make cough medicine to take preparatory measures. They asked companies to make sure they secure enough raw materials before China eases regulations further. Shin Yun, Arirang News. Starting this month, South Korea plans to develop a long-range air-to-surface guided missile to be mounted on the locally developed KF-21. To achieve this, the National Defense Procurement Agency said Monday that the plan through 2028 will cost about 145 million U.S. dollars. Led by the Agency for Defense Development, the missile will be designed to hit ground targets hundreds of kilometers away. If successful, this will be South Korea's first domestically developed air launch missile. It's expected to help increase exports of the fighter jets and speed up the development of other types of guided weapon systems. Elsewhere around the world, Ukraine is increasingly calling on foreign powers to assist the war-torn country as it is suffering from power outages in many regions following Russian strikes. Battles raged on over the weekend with Moscow targeting Odessa and Ukraine bombarding Russian barracks. Han sung woo has the latest. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is stepping up his diplomatic campaigning to unite world forces against Russian aggression. According to his official Telegram account, the leader had a phone call on Sunday with U.S. President Joe Biden, whom he thanked for the unprecedented defense and financial assistance. Zelensky added that he appreciated Washington's efforts to restore Ukraine's energy system and stressed to Biden the importance of forming a capable air defense for his country. He also revealed in his nightly address that he had talks on the phone with French President Emmanuel Macron on steps to implement peace and Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan on assuring Ukraine's grain exports. We discussed opportunities to expand our Black Sea export corridor. I expressed gratitude for the support of our humanitarian initiative, Grain from Ukraine. We agreed on some important joint steps for the nearest future. The Ukrainian leader's efforts come amid power outages caused by waves of Russian missile and drone strikes on Ukraine's power grid since October. Reuters reports Moscow used Iranian-made drones on Saturday to strike two energy plants in the Black Sea port of Odessa, leaving 1.5 million people without power. Restoration work continues in the south of our country. We are doing everything to return light to Odessa. At this time, it has become possible to partially restore supplies in Odessa and other cities and districts in the region. We are doing everything to reach the maximum number possible in the conditions that developed after the Russian strikes. Meanwhile, Ukrainian forces are believed to have struck the regional headquarters of Russia's Wagner mercenary group in the eastern region of Luhansk. That's according to governor-in-exile Serhi Haidai, who said the group had suffered major losses. He expects further losses due to the lack of available medical care in the area. Multiple explosions were also reported in the occupied southern city of Melitopol, where officials say Ukraine had launched a missile attack on Russian barracks. Han Sung-woo, Arirang News. Heavy shelling at the Pakistan-Afghanistan border on Sunday killed and injured dozens, including civilians, as relations continue to sour between the neighboring countries. The clash was the result of a dispute over the construction of border checkpoints. Jung Eun-ju has the details. At least six Pakistani civilians and one Afghan soldier were killed on Sunday in cross-border shelling and gunfire at the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. The clash took place near the Chaman border crossing, which links Pakistan's southwestern province with Afghanistan's southern Kandahar province. The Pakistan army said Sunday that 17 people were injured and the casualties were due to unprovoked and indiscriminate fire on civilians. 
Pakistan's Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif said the deaths were unfortunate and deserve the strongest condemnation. In Afghanistan, a spokesman for Kandahar's governor said the clash started after Pakistani forces had demanded that the construction of new checkpoints on the Afghan side of the border should stop. Kandahar police confirmed that one Afghan soldier was killed and that 10 other people, including three civilians, were injured. A doctor at a hospital in Chaman told the Associated Press that live rounds injured 27 people brought in for treatment. An Afghan official in Kandahar told Reuters the situation had returned to normal after the two sides held a meeting. The crossing was closed for several days last month after similar clashes. A deadly shooting in November led to an eight-day closure, causing heavy commercial losses and leaving thousands of people stranded on both sides. Pakistan's foreign office said that Afghan authorities have been told that a recurrence must be avoided and the strictest possible action must be taken against those responsible. Chong eun Arirang News. The UN agency dealing with biodiversity says 10% of marine life is at risk of extinction. At its recent summit, the agency called for efforts to halt and reverse habitat loss. Yoo Eun Jin has the full story. The International Union for Conservation of Nature has sounded the alarm over the devastation that climate change is having on marine life. At the Convention on Biological Diversity held in Montreal, the United Nations body said nearly one-tenth of underwater plants and animals is threatened with extinction. The union announced that more than 1,550 of some 17,903 marine plants and animals assessed were on its red list of threatened species, meaning that they are at risk of extinction. These figures are likely just the tip of the iceberg of what may be happening underwater. Head of the IUCN Red List, Craig Hilton-Taylor, emphasized that you can't really see what's going on underwater, and such assessments act as a real indicator of what is happening and show that it's not good news. Among the creatures under threat, the IUCN this year gave attention to the dugong, a large and docile marine mammal that lives from the eastern coast of Africa to the western Pacific Ocean. Also called the sea cow, the number of remaining dugong have fallen to fewer than 250 adults in East Africa and fewer than 900 in the French territory of New Caledonia. Also facing threat is the dugong's main food source, seagrass, due to oil and gas exploration and production. And the pillar coral, a Caribbean species, degraded two categories from vulnerable to critically endangered. And many species of abalone, a mollusk sold as high-end food, also face extinction. The chair of the IUCN Species Survival Commission Marine Conservation Committee says the latest announcement of the awful status of these species should shock us into urgent action. Ian Jin, Arirang News. Scientists in South Korea recently discovered a way to prevent waste building up in streams after flooding triggered by monsoons. They've developed a floating divider that collects all the waste on the water. It works in conjunction with a new AI system that identifies them in real time. Cho Sung Min explains further. One of the major consequences of torrential rain induced flooding is a buildup waste in rivers and lakes. Two years ago, a field of plastic waste covered the waters underneath the bridge in Chungcheongbuk-do province. Without proper care, waste either sinks to the bottom of the stream or flows into the sea. Local authorities tried to install structures to prevent that from happening. But strong water currents and maintenance issues got in the way of putting the idea into action. But with a recent breakthrough by a South Korean research team, a fully functional divider has been developed. The dividers float and can filter out debris even if the water is flowing quickly. It also developed a cutting-edge artificial intelligence system that can detect the amount and types of waste in real time. Developers say it's a substantial upgrade from conventional ways of manually sorting and recycling the waste. It uses big data collected from a wide range of captured images of the actual waste that had previously been found. According to the developers, the system is 97% accurate in recognizing what kind of waste it is. Using the AI-based image data, we can confirm how much and what types of waste are collected and then decide what we need to do to retrieve it, making it an efficient means of management. Using the new dividers and AI system, the developers plan to run a field test in a local stream in Chungcheongnam-do province in December. 
They are hoping the new developments can effectively prevent up to 60% of the locally produced marine waste that usually ends up in the sea. Cho Songmin, Ariang News. Recent years have seen rapid growth in so-called wellness tourism as people spend more on their health. South Korea has been developing its own industry by promoting local destinations where people can enjoy the natural environment. Shin Ayong reports. More people are making healthy living a priority. One of the rapidly growing lifestyle industries is wellness tourism, where people go on trips to improve their body and mind. According to the Global Wellness Institute, the market is expected to hit 1.1 trillion US dollars by 2025 with an average annual growth of almost 21 percent. Considering the potential of this market, the Korea Tourism Organization has selected 58 wellness tourism spots in South Korea under four categories. Beauty and Spa, Traditional Korean Medicine, Nature and Forest, and Healing and Meditation. Museum Han is one of the attractions. It's surrounded by mountains and is well known for meditation. In this hall, you can meditate in various ways to get positive energy and feel refreshed. One of the options is singing bowl silent meditation. With the vibration of the singing bowl, visitors can focus entirely on themselves. Visitors can also commune with nature as the arc-shaped window allows sunlight into the gray hall. The James Turrell Exhibition Hall is another quiet and contemplative space where people can feel refreshed while looking at sunrise and sunset. Visitors can also experience a moment of disorientation in a chamber filled with only lights. South Korea has four distinct seasons. The museum combines architecture, nature and art together for tourists to recognize the changes in seasons. The South Korean government has been focusing on boosting its wellness travel industry. The Yoon administration announced the promotion of wellness tourism as one of the national administrative tasks. The tourism ministry is planning to push for legislation that would provide systematic support to the industry. With the ministry planning to inject more money into wellness tourism next year, the industry is expected to boom over the coming years. Shin Ayong, Arirang News, Wonju. Conditions for tomorrow are shaping up to be a wintry mix of sleet and snowfall across the nation. Snow has now started to fall for Gangwon-do province and the surrounding regions. Tomorrow, more widespread snowfall is in the forecast. Snowfall amounts will be the highest across western regions. Southern Gyeonggi-do and Chungcheong-do provinces will see 3 to 8 centimeters. The Seoul metropolitan area will see about 1 to 3. But along with the snow system, a surge of frigid air will also filter into the nation. Starting tomorrow daytime, temperatures will take another steep dive. By Wednesday, lows will plummet all the way down to minus 10 degrees Celsius in Seoul. Gusty winds are in the forecast tomorrow for coastal regions in particular. Winds will be gusting as fast as 10 to 16 meters per second. Keep in mind that wind-driven rain and blowing snowfall may reduce visibility, so please be careful when driving. Tomorrow's hall will be starting up at minus 1 degree, Gwangju and Daegu at 2 degrees Celsius. Central regions such as Seoul will be cold at 2 degrees for the daytime. Southern parts of the country will be relatively warmer, Busan will be reaching 11 degrees. Cold wave conditions will persist for the remainder of the week. That's all for now, and here are the weather conditions around the world. And that's all from us. As always, thank you for watching.